Alrighty guys, so today's video is going to be on skeletal muscle um, and how we get skeletal muscles to contract. So what is a skeletal muscle? This is a muscle type that is attached to your skeleton as implied in the name and it is under somatic control. So it is a voluntary muscle where you think and then your muscle moves. Um, also this is a muscle known as striated muscle because under a microscope it looks like it has striations kind of like a striped pattern of dark and light bands which we can cover in a separate video so you want to move a skeletal muscle how are we going to get there well your brain is going to send down a signal down through your spinal cord to the ventral horn of your spinal cord where the motor neurons are then the ventral horn is going to send a motor neuron axon out to your target muscle and here's our motor neuron axon and it's going to be depolarized so as soon as this wave of depolarization reaches our motor neuron terminal axon we have an influx of calcium so calcium channels open calcium goes into the motor neuron and this results in a release of acetylcholine now acetylcholine is a very important neurotransmitter for muscle contraction because it allows for depolarization of your muscle cells. So we now have acetylcholine in our junction over here and it's going to bind a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor which I'll outline here in black for you. So this is our nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and what this really is Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are actually ligand gated sodium channels. So, our ligand is our acetylcholine and it's a sodium channel. So, once it's open, it's going to let sodium flow down its concentration gradient into the muscle cell because sodium is in higher concentration outside cells. Now, this depolarization caused by the influx of sodium will continue and open voltage gated sodium channels which I outline in black further down here and it's going to allow sodium to keep coming in unidirectionally so we're going to get the movement of our depolarization down in this direction I'm not saying that it can't also move in this direction but for the sake of our demonstration we're going to get depolarization moving down the muscle fiber and eventually the depolarization, which is actually happening very close to the membrane up here, is going to reach a T-tubule and descend down the tubule. Now what is a T-tubule and why is it important? So T-tubules are found in skeletal muscle organizations. So we're going to have to do a little bit of skeletal muscle anatomy to understand why they're important. Skeletal muscles are organized in muscle fibers, which I've outlined here in black. And these muscle fibers are composed of a lot of separate individual structures called myofibrils. So myofibrils are essentially what they are is a fiber composed of a lot of individual muscle cells known as myofilaments. So if you look inside, you'll see a lot of little dots here. And those are actually individual muscle cells, which are also known as myofilaments. So uh, we have a whole entire structure known as a muscle fiber which is composed of myofibrils which are composed of myofilaments. Now here's our uh, motor neuron axon and we need to get this depolarization signal through this thick structure so that we can get um, our depolarization to all of our muscle cells so they get activated at the same time. Well how do you do this? You use invaginating structures known as T-tubules. So that's how T-tubules are a crucial structure in our muscle fiber. It allows for the depolarization of all our little muscle cells even deeper inside our muscle fiber structure. Okay, so our depolarization has reached our T-tubules and it's dived down into the tubule itself. Now T-tubules have an important structure inside of them known as a di, sorry the word cut off here, dihydropyridine receptor, which is this red structure over here. So in the T-tubule, our dihydropyridine receptor gets depolarized, and this causes a conformational change 
in the dihydropyridine receptor, and since it's linked to something called a ryanidine receptor, that also undergoes a conformational change, which allows which now allows for calcium to exit the sarcoplasmic reticulum inside our muscle cell. So let's go through that again since I think it was a little bit confusing. So our dihydropyridine receptor and our ryanidine receptor as well as our sarcoplasmic reticulum are all linked. The dihydropyridine receptor depolarizes, changes conformation, causes a change in conformation in the ryanidine receptor on our muscle cell and now our sarcoplasmic reticulum gets opened up and calcium, which is really high inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, can flow out into the muscle cell and bind to troponin C. So if you haven't heard the word sarcoplasmic reticulum before, don't worry, it's just a fancy name for the smooth ER inside a muscle cell. And in this case, smooth ER is used for holding calcium so that we have uh, storage for when we need to activate our crossbird cycling. So our calcium is now higher inside our muscle cell because it flowed out of our SR and it's going to go ahead and bind troponin C which is represented by the green dots in this diagram here. And once troponin C is bound uh, it now acts with troponin T and troponin I and the tropomyosin fiber, which is found here on actin, is going to move because of a conformational change and allow our myosin head to go ahead and bind actin. So our myosin head has now bound actin, which you can see down here, and it is ready to initiate contraction. So myosin is going to release uh, the phosphate, which is bound to it in this state, and it's going to do something called the power stroke, where it pulls on actin in one way, or it causes muscle contraction. Then our ADP, which is, was also attached to our myosin head, is now going to be released at, to make room for ATP. So ATP, in this case, its functional role is to allow for our myosin head to be released from our actin filament. And it's also the reason our myosin head can do the power stroke in the first place because when it gets hydrolyzed and forms ADP plus phosphate it's going to cock this myosin head back as you'll see it's slightly more tilted in this picture than here so it's going to cock it back and allow for this energy to be stored until the tropomyosin has been moved and our myosin head can attach. So. Let's go over this in a general summary. Our neuron comes and depolarizes our muscle fiber. Um, this allows for the release of calcium inside of our muscle cell. The muscle cell release of calcium now allows for tropomyosin to move out of the way and for myosin to bind actin. And then with the help of ATP, we have the occurrence of this crossbridge cycling. So calcium's main function here is just to move tropomyosin out of the way. That's the whole purpose for our neuron, just to have elevated levels of calcium so we can just have this crossbridge cycling occurring. As long as you have elevated calcium levels inside your muscle cells, this crossbridge cycle can keep going and you, have, you can get chronic contraction. So if you've ever seen uh, someone with, let's say, malignant hyperthermia. This is a defect in the ryanidine receptor where it stays chronically open uh, due to a reacting with, uh, usually it's a, a substance like caffeine or halothane, for example. And the ryanidine receptor stays active. You have continuous high levels of calcium and you can get continuous crossbird cycling. So the person's muscles are going to be in spasm. They're going to be contracting a lot. And why it's called malignant hypothermia is because when muscles contract, they release a lot of energy because they consume all of this ATP. And that causes the person to heat up quite substantially. Okay, so our calcium, the purpose of our calcium is to keep this cycle going. The purpose of our ATP is to allow for the myosin head 
to release from actin. If you've ever seen someone who has died uh, re and they have undergone rigor mortis, or if you've ever seen a movie or a TV show where someone dies and they undergo rigor mortis, they become really stiff. That's because your myosin head cannot release from actin, and now, since you have very low levels of ATP, you're not really metabolizing, and the body will stiff up because the muscles are now in contraction. And they're maintaining contraction because of low levels of ATP. Alright, I hope this video helped, and I'll see you guys in the next one.